First Corinthians Introduction Author and Title The first word of 1 Corinthians states that Paul is its author. There is no good reason to doubt this. The theological concerns of the letter, the energy of its style, its vocabulary and its historical connections with the other Pauline letters and Acts mark it as Pauline. The traditional title of the letter means that it is the first of two canonical letters by Paul to the Corinthians, not that it was Paul's first letter to them, as will be discussed in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 9. Date Paul wrote 1 Corinthians from the city of Ephesus in the Roman province of Asia. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 8, and The churches of Asia send greetings. Aquila and Prisca, together with the church in their house, greet you warmly in the Lord, 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 19, since Ephesus was the main city in the province of Asia. It was written some time before the final day of Pentecost, as just confirmed in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 8, and therefore in the springtime. It is unclear whether this was the spring of AD 53, 54 or 55. He wrote in any case near the end of his three year ministry in Ephesus. I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter, so that you may send me on my way wherever I go. I do not want to see you now just in passing, for I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verses 5 to 9 And Now after these things had been accomplished, Paul resolved in the spirit to go through Macedonia and Achaia, and then to go on to Jerusalem. He said, After I have gone there, I must also see Rome. So he sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia, while he himself stayed for some time longer in Asia. Acts chapter 19 verses 21 to 22 Corinth was the leading city in the province of Achaia. Theme 1 Corinthians covers a number of topics as recorded in key themes. One theme emerges from these discussions, however, as Paul's dominant concern. Paul wanted this church, divided because of the arrogance of its more powerful members, to work together for the advancement of the gospel. He wanted them to drop their divisive one-upmanship, build up the faith of those who are weak, and witness effectively to unbelievers. Purpose Corinth sat on the isthmus connecting the Greek mainland with the Peloponnesian Peninsula. This location made it a flourishing crossroads for sea traffic between the Aegean region and the western Mediterranean. It was a place where many cultures and religions mingled. Since it was a Roman colony, Roman law and customs were important, particularly among the upper classes. But many gods and many lords, referred to in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 5, had found a home in Corinth. The worship of these gods was fully integrated into governmental affairs, civic festivals, trade guilds and social clubs, and everyday life in general. Corinth was also a destination for travelling professional orators who charged a fee for attendance at their entertaining rhetorical displays and advised people on how to advance socially. Into this milieu, Paul brought the gospel of Jesus Christ, and soon the church was established. He was aided in his work by two newfound friends from Rome, Priscilla and Aquila, who, like Paul, were displaced Jews and fellow tent makers. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they worked together. By trade they were tent makers. Every Sabbath he would argue in the synagogue and would try to convince Jews and Greeks. Acts chapter 18 verses 1 to 4 Greet Prisca and Aquila, who work with me in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 16 verse 3 And Greet Prisca and Aquila, and the household of Anisiphorus. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 19 Paul, Priscilla and Aquila spent 18 months in Corinth in the early 50s and then, after a brief trip to Judea and Syria, Paul travelled to Ephesus. Priscilla and Aquila were already there. When they reached Ephesus, he left them there, but first he himself went into the synagogue and had a discussion with the Jews. Acts chapter 18 verse 19 And The churches of Asia send greetings. Aquila and Prisca, together with the church in their house, greet you warmly in the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 19 
and by the time Paul arrived, they had already met a skillful Christian apologist, Apollos, who then travelled to and taught in Corinth, as recorded in Acts chapter 18 verse 24 to chapter 19 verse 1. Apollos is mentioned on several occasions in this letter, especially with regard to the way some followed his teaching. Paul settled and taught in Ephesus for three years, something he revealed in his farewell speech to the Ephesian elders. Therefore be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to warn everyone with tears. Acts chapter 20 verse 31 And at some point wrote to the Corinthians the otherwise unknown letter that he refers to in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 9. It is not known what prompted the letter, but it dealt with sexual immorality, a persistent problem for the Corinthian church, that Paul returns to again extensively in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 1 to 13 and chapter 6 verses 12 to 20. Sometime later, Paul received an oral report indicating that the Corinthians had not only misunderstood his first letter, but were plagued with serious problems of division, sexual immorality and social snobbery. Around the same time, a letter arrived from the Corinthians that displayed considerable theological confusion about marriage, divorce, participation in pagan religions, order within corporate worship, and the bodily resurrection of Christians. In response to these troubling developments, Paul felt compelled to write a substantial letter to Corinth, making the case that much of their conduct was out of step with the gospel. At the root of their disunity lay an arrogance that was incompatible with God's free gifts to them in Christ, wisdom, righteousness, sanctification and redemption. In addition, a self-centered insistence on their own rights at the expense of the weak and marginalized revealed that their own social advancement rather than the gospel's advancement was their top priority. At the root of much of the immorality and idolatry in Corinth, moreover, lay a lack of appreciation for the holiness that God requires of his people. Although the particulars of the Mosaic law were no longer to define the boundaries for God's people, Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but obeying the commandments of God is everything. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 19 The law's underlying theme that God's people were to be set apart, a people marked off from their culture, remained in place. In addition, the dwelling of God's Spirit within each believer, and the new unity that the believers had with the resurrected living Christ, implied that the Corinthians needed to make a clean break from the moral impurity of their culture. Despite the often stern tone of the letter, Paul was thankful to God for the Corinthians and felt a deep personal affection for them. Because of this love, and for the purposes of God's glory, so, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 31 Paul wanted the Corinthians to become a well-constructed dwelling place for God's Spirit, and to be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 8b The ancient city of Corinth The Acro of Corinth is a small but steep mountain, 1,886 feet or 575 meters high, on the Peloponnesian Peninsula in southern Greece. Ancient Corinth was built at the mountain's foot, benefiting also from the natural spring that provided water for the town. In Paul's day, Corinth, although a couple of miles inland, oversaw the territory connecting the Adriatic port of Lechion on the west with the Aegean port of Sincrea to the east. Ships were often portaged between these seaports across the narrow stretch of the Peloponnesian Isthmus, approximately 3.7 miles or 6 kilometers wide at its narrowest. Several rulers in the 1st century AD foolishly attempted to construct a canal across the Isthmus, but this was not successfully accomplished until the 19th century. The famed Greek city of Corinth, renowned for its artistry in bronze, its wealth and its wanton sexuality, was destroyed in 146 BC during a war with Rome. The city was refounded as a Roman colony in 44 BC by Roman freedmen, and the distinct archaeological strata in the city centre testify to this gap in its history. Inscriptions from the first 100 years of the new colony were mostly in Latin, although strong marks of Greek culture were also evident in the art and life of the city. First century Corinth followed a Roman city plan based on a rectangular grid. Typical urban structures were built or reconstructed, such as shops, stowers, basilicas, a bulletarian used for the city council meetings, a gymnasium, baths, public toilets and a theatre. A few large houses from this period have also been excavated. The centre of the town boasted the refashioned Perini Fountain as a pleasant place from which to draw spring water. To this day, a raised speaker's platform stands in the main forum, 
and a nearby inscription refers to this platform as the rostra, equivalent to a bema or tribunal. This is probably the very location where Galio judged Paul to be innocent. Refer to Acts chapter 18 verses 12 to 17. Some other significant archaeological remains date from post-New Testament times, such as the Odeon, a small covered theatre. In Paul's day, the great Doric-style temple, dedicated to Athena or Apollo from the 6th century BC, remained a central feature in Corinth, and multiple temples to other deities dotted the city. Indeed, when the author Pausanias wrote about Corinth in the mid-2nd century AD, his description of the city read like a tour guide of pagan monumental sacred sites. Corinth boasted an important sanctuary of Asclepios, the god of healing, where people would come to offer sacrifices to the god and to seek medical care. Marks of the imperial cult were evident, especially if some are correct in identifying the substantial temple E as being dedicated to Augustus' sister Octavia, although it may have been for Jupiter. The famous Hellenistic-era temple of Aphrodite, atop the Acro Corinth, had been rebuilt as a rather small structure during the 1st century AD. Scholars debate whether Strabo's account of 1,000 temple prostitutes refers to the earlier Hellenistic temple of Aphrodite or to the Roman one of Paul's day. The former seems more probable. Strabo, Geography, 8.6.20c. In any case, in Roman times, wanton sexuality would have been common at such a port city. For other important archaeological features, refer to comments made on 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verses 24 to 27, i.e. the Isthmian Games, chapter 8 verse 1 to chapter 11 verse 1, referring to the meat market, Acts chapter 18 verse 4 for the synagogue and Judaism, and Romans chapter 16 verse 23 for the inscription relating to Erastus. Corinth in the time of Paul, circa AD 60. The city plan shows those features of the city of Corinth that archaeologists have so far identified as dating from the time of Paul. Others remain to be discovered by future archaeological excavations. There is an image of Corinth in the time of Paul, circa AD 60. Key themes 1. Since the church is the dwelling place of God's Spirit, the people who make up the church should work for unity by building each other up. 2. Christians should build up the church in four practical ways. a. They should be sensitive to those of fragile faith. b. They should win unbelievers through culturally sensitive evangelism. c. They should conduct worship services in such a way that unbelievers present might come to faith. d. Their corporate worship should use spiritual gifts not for personal display or evaluating who has a better gift, but to build up the church. 3. Sexual relations form a union between man and woman, as profound as the union of the believer with Christ, and so sexual activity should be confined to marriage. 4. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are important, but both are subordinate to personal trust in the Gospel and to living in the way that God commands. 5. The bodily resurrection of Jesus and of his followers from the dead is a critical component of Christian faith and practice. Summary of Salvation History Christians are God's own people, the family of God, the body of Christ. Refer to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verses 12 to 31 and the temple of the Holy Spirit, chapter 3 verse 16. As those who fulfill the Old Testament pattern for the people of God, they are to be a holy community, chapter 1 verse 2 reflecting God's character. Instead, as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all your conduct, for it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 15 to 16 Writing style 1 Corinthians is a pastoral letter to a spiritually troubled church. Like other New Testament epistles, it is an occasional letter, and one can quite readily piece together the things that occasioned it by noting signals in the text. The letter is highly relevant today, as it deals with such issues as the relationship between Christians and the surrounding pagan culture, divisions within the church, the ordering of church practices such as the Lord's Supper, and the use of spiritual gifts. The letter also deals with matters of personal morality, such as sex, marriage, celibacy, and the virtues, especially love. 1 Corinthians follows the form of a typical first century epistle, although its content is governed by the specific situation in the Corinthian church. For example, 
the usual epistolary elements of salutation, thanksgiving and paralysis, a set of moral exhortations, receive scant treatment. The body of the letter is taken up with situations and questions from the Corinthian church that Paul addresses, and the epistolary closure in chapter 16 is extensive because of business Paul has with the church. The rhetorical modes of exhortation and instruction dominate the letter. Chapter 13 is an encomium, a written tribute, in praise of love. The book makes extensive use of rhetorical techniques such as contrast, repetition and analogy. It draws sharp contrast between truth and error and between moral good and evil. Because Paul regards the Corinthian Christians as being out of line in a number of areas, the letter exhibits a strong corrective tone. The setting of 1 Corinthians, circa AD 53-55 Paul wrote 1 Corinthians during his third missionary journey, near to the end of his three-year ministry in Ephesus. Both Corinth and Ephesus were wealthy port cities steeped in pagan idolatry and philosophy. Corinth benefited both militarily and economically from its strategic location at one end of the isthmus that connected the southern Greek peninsula to the mainland. There is a map of the region showing Corinth in relation to Ephesus and other key cities in the area. Outline 1 Corinthians is a very detailed letter and covers a wide range of teaching and exhortation. For the purposes of study it has eight major sections, although some of them are quite brief. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 1 to 19 Salutation Paul identifies himself as author and Corinth as the receiving church. He gives thanks for all of them, reminds them of their faith in Christ and exhorts them to continue in what they have been taught. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 10 to chapter 4 verse 21 Divisions over Christian preachers Paul had personally established the church in Corinth where he had ministered for 18 months during his second missionary journey. While in Ephesus on his next journey, he received a report that the church had encountered problems because of splits in the church caused by the arrogance of some of its members, who believed they were perhaps superior in wisdom and the knowledge of God. Paul reminds them that their faith is not about the mysteries of God taught through Judaism or the wisdom of the Greek philosophers, but is the simple fact of the gospel. Those in the church should also be wary not to align themselves to an individual leader such as Apollos or Paul, for it is Christ who was crucified for them and him they should seek. Paul goes on to say that he feeds them as infants and not as mature adults, for they have not yet reached the stage in their faith where they have fully grasped the truth of their reliance on God and not on themselves. He calls on them not to be arrogant, but to live according to what they have been taught. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 1 to chapter 6 verse 20 A report of sexual immorality and legal wrangling Paul now continues by addressing two specific areas that had been reported to him that were of a major concern to him. Some members were being sexually immoral and other church members were permitting this to continue unchecked. Such behaviour is more than displeasing to God. It appears also that there were disputes, probably over some money owed by one church member to another who was then taking the dispute before the courts rather than seeking resolution through the church. Such behaviour was disreputable to both the church and to Christ. Paul exhorts his readership to bring glory to God in all they do rather than resort to legalistic practices. They are reminded that their bodies are the holy dwelling place of God's Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1 to chapter 11 verse 1 Three issues from a Corinthian letter Paul then goes on to remind the church of the sanctity of marriage. A husband and wife should willingly give of themselves to the other. Those who are not married should remain celibate. If a spouse is an unbeliever, the couple should remain married. But if the unbeliever should choose to leave the marriage, the other partner is not bound to take them back. Paul warns of the potential pitfalls of marriage in terms of the distractions it can have in one's service to God. It is not an instruction not to marry, but a reminder that one would feel natural obligations to one's family that may prevent them fulfilling a particular calling on their lives. The old food laws had ceased with the coming of Christ, but there was still an issue of food sacrifice to idols. Since idols are man-made and therefore are non-existent, there is no inherent problem with eating such food if a believer is strong in their faith and understanding of the issues. However, if someone of weaker faith sees the eating of such food as a sin, then for them it is a sin and they should not eat it. 
Paul demonstrates, both from the calling of the apostles by the Lord and from the teachings within the Mosaic law, that those who work for the church or in other aspects of God's work are worthy of material reward for their services. However, Paul points out that he personally has never taken up this right, for he would not wish others to misconstrue his intentions of proclaiming the gospel simply for material gain or as a means of earning a living. Paul provides several examples from the Bible where the Hebrews had failed to remain obedient to God's call and warns his readership not to fall into the same trap. He calls on them to do everything for the purpose of bringing glory to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 2 to chapter 14 verse 40 Divisions over corporate worship Here Paul addresses several issues that are causing problems when the church meets. The first is the manner of dress, particularly the cultural need for women to keep their heads covered and men theirs uncovered. There were also issues around taking communion, where some were treating it like a social meal and others coming to it in an unworthy state. Paul reminds them that it is a command from the Lord to remember him and his sacrifice for them. Paul then provides one of the most detailed summaries concerning spiritual gifts and their purposes. He also warns members of the church not to think of one gift being superior to another, or believing that the person possessing such a gift as being in any way better than a person who does not. The writer then gives a beautiful and well-crafted account that demonstrates that true love is God's gift to all people. Other key gifts are those of prophesying and speaking in tongues. It appears that the church in Corinth saw speaking in tongues as an indication of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Correctly used, of course, and when accompanied by interpretation, it is a fundamental way that God edifies the church. Paul himself was a prolific speaker in tongues, yet he acknowledges that it is the gift of prophecy that will help to encourage others to join the church and build the faith. The final requirement of corporate worship is the need for order. It is not right for individuals to dominate the meeting especially with regard to talking over others who may be prophesying or bringing a word of encouragement. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 to 58 The futility of faith of the dead are not raised. The penultimate chapter speaks of three fundamental aspects of the Christian faith. 1. The fact that Jesus was raised from the dead following his sacrificial death. This demonstration of both God's love and power are at the heart of the gospel truth. 2. The fact that Christian believers will also be raised to new life when the time comes. This has to be true if the resurrection of Christ is true. If it is not true, then the resurrection of Christ is also false, and the Christian faith has no basis to its claim. 3. When the dead are raised, they will receive imperishable resurrection bodies, just as Jesus has. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verses 1 to 12 A collection for the saints and travel plans Paul was about to leave Ephesus and travel through Macedonia before heading south again to Corinth. A key reason for this extended journey was to take delivery of the offerings made by the various churches in these regions that would then be taken to the poor in Jerusalem. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verses 13 to 24 Final Messages and Greetings Paul finally urges those in Corinth to support others who are working for the church in their city. He goes on to offer his personal greetings and those of others serving with him in Ephesus. Introduction to 1 Corinthians ends.